Stitch. Hey. Stitch. Shh. Stitch. Unpossible 15. Get 15% off deck for distributors. So what happened? So you and Colin go to Virginia on some yeah. little escapade. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. We what was this? What'd you do? Uh, so we Why? went down to Freedom Shooting Center where we went before when we were all down there. Um, Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach, yep. It's a cool indoor range. It's a big gun store. Um, it is a large gun store. Yeah, they've got a lot of classrooms. Just like well, Let's just call them mega stores now so you know what we're talking yeah. about. So it's a, one of, it's a big trend the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. Big store and gun range together. Yeah, it's, it's kind of similar to White Birch here. Um, mm-hmm. It's bigger physically, but it's a similar idea. Yeah. Um, so we went down there. We partnered up with Raise Them Outdoors and Tactical Distributors. Unpossible what? 15 gets you 15% <sighs> off at checkout. And man, those fucking tactical panties are titties. Yeah. What it, what's Raise Them Outdoors? So it's a nonprofit, um, and it's a, a girl who works at, or a lady who works at, um, she works at Freedom. But Check she, yourself. I know. I don't know what. She's older than I am, but not very old. Um, so a lady, I suppose. So she runs this nonprofit and uh, she puts on camps all around the country for kids um, just to get them into the outdoors, basically. So a lot of fishing, shooting, that kind of stuff. Um, That's cool. Yeah. And she'll do overnight camps for these kids and their parents. And they do anything from, like I said, learning how to cast rods to shooting shotguns or shooting rifles or whatever, just to introduce them to um, all the little outdoorsy things. It's a chick. Yep. That's so awesome. Yeah, she's she's super cool. She hunts. she a mom? She is a mom. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, she hunts. She does. She's outdoor outdoor yeah. gal for sure, um, and she can shoot too. But so she, when Todd was up here in March, he floated the idea of like, oh, you guys, there's an area down, or there's a place down by me that there's a lot of kids in the area, and like it'd be cool to introduce them to the silencers. So we were into it, and then it just so happened that she. And him must have been talking. And this is kind of what she does as far as the kid camps and all that. So we just kind of put the idea together to do both of the things. So she had a bunch of, she it was an open sign up. Um, parents and their kids could sign up. You would come to Freedom and we had a bunch of 22s. Um, and then we brought some uh, Honey Badger Sugar Weasel as well. Mm. Um, and we put cans on all of the guns just to show the kids um, to introduce them to silencers, to show how their overall experience will be better, like explain what a silencer does, all that. And they shot. There were almost 100 kids, I think, that were there throughout the day. I did get a lot of good feedback on social media, people yeah. messaging me. Yeah, everyone was really excited. Honestly, the kids were really excited, which was cool. Um, at one <laughs> they point, They were all like, thanks for sending Jay and Colin down here. This is awesome. I was like, I don't even know what y'all are talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it was fun. Um, I was, I anticipated, because the way that Aaron, the the lady who puts it on the way that she explained all of her other camps, like they, they shoot two, two, three unsuppressed. And mm-hmm. she's like, some of the kids like they like it, but some of the younger kids are a little, they're scared yeah, of scary. it. Yeah. 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 So One of my daughters like hated fireworks till she's like 10. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we were anticipating that, but it never really happened. There was only like one or two people. Cause at towards the end of the day, um, we did a little demonstration for them where I shot a couple rounds unsuppressed with a sugar weasel. Jay doing a demo. Yeah. And uh what are we doing as a company? I know. The RSOs were just like, Yeah, go do it. So <laughs> so I'd shoot unsuppressed and then put a trash band on and shoot suppressed. Did you go Wayne Weber like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, upside down and around. Um inverted. Exactly. Yeah. Inverted. Um but no, that and that was a, a big change. Or you could see all the kids would get they're like, Whoa, they thought it was magic. Because it's <laughs> so I mean, we're indoors, so it's they so are. loud. It is magic. And like with the cherry bomb too, we were throwing flame inside, and so all the kids That's were horrible. Like, they were yeah, they were terrified. And then you put the trash band on; it's super manageable. And they all um, I'll I'll send you the photo to put up. There's a little girl; she's five, shooting a honey badger. For um, real? Loved it. Yeah, she. Th- so they all shot the honey badger and the the sugar weasel if they wanted to. Man, because y- you know what? 
You know the two things I have love for? Streets. And the children. And the children. The I know, kids. I know. I yeah. still do. I got love for both. And both of them still, like, get on my fucking nerves yeah. now. <laughs> but yeah. still got love for both. Yeah, it was super successful. It was, we anticipated it was going to be probably like 10, 12-year-olds, whatever. And there were kids straight up five years old to, to 17. Man, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and, and so Aaron like does that. hundred kids. Man. That's that's a great event. It was a long day, but it yeah, because indoor range too. Yeah, it's all, it makes for a long day. Yeah, and we brought fifteen cans down there, twenty two cans, mm-hmm. um, and they would do. Her thing was they would do um, competitions, and so winners of the competitions would would win a can, and then we also just kind of gave can any kids that we saw either having like a sick time or they were super polite or whatever, we'd give them a can too. But I love that. Yeah, so it was awesome, and because you know how I roll with that, and. We have love for the streets. We do. And, and the, the children. Kids, yeah. 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 So it was really cool. It was all the parents were excited. I think they ended up, we, so beforehand we sent a bunch of Q stuff down so they would have it in stock too. And I think they sold a bunch of it. Um, did y'all take the kid version of these shirts? We did. There were a bunch of kids with the kid version on. Oh, I saw already? More, I saw more mystery shirts down there than I've ever seen anywhere. Man, that's awesome. Such a super high con. And a bunch of the adults were like, man, if I knew there was a kid version, like, like if I knew what it would have been, I would have gotten the kid version too. Would Uncle Todd bring them to hand out? Um, no, the people who bought them. They well, I'm just saying. What oh. about kids didn't have them? Y'all didn't bring some extras? I think they I think they were all shipped out and all that by then. But <sighs> no, Todd's slipping. We didn't have extras of those, but Todd's we did. slipping. Tactical Distributors did all the, the event shirts and um, trifold pamphlets. Those are really cool. The little There's like just some safety rules on there and explains what a... <laughs> Look at Jay using marketing keywords over here. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. tr- He's going to ask me for now. a raise on Friday. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, big marketing. It's like, guy. Kevin, I've been trying really hard. <laughs> like the trifolds. <laughs> The email blast, <laughs> all the social media stuff, the analytics. I mean, I'm all over the it. The trifles are great. The tri- trifles are great. They're really cool. But it's gonna be like marketing's in my blood, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Respect. Yeah. No, it was fun. It was super successful. We went with Uncle Todd and shot at some white tail as well. Colin got a little white tail. Deer. Um, deer. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, deer. Um, yeah, we ran into a bunch of people that. So a lot of people that were there when we did the little. Like meet and greet thing at Freedom Before. A bunch yeah. of guys that were there came up and went, hey, we were here last time. Oh, whatever. So, yeah, 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 nice. Yeah, yeah I got really some cool. messages asking if I was down there. I was like, nah, y'all stuck with Jay and Kyle. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it was fun. I had to do a little public speaking a few times, but. How'd you do? I would assume you'd be great at that. Yeah, it, it makes fun. you nervous? No, no. Man, I, I remember in college when we had like the, when I was in college to get like your undergraduate, you had a speech class. <laughs> And I remember people that it was like their third and fourth time in it and they would drop it. Like they were so nervous of public speaking. Yeah. And like, I remember even being nervous about it, but it's like, I'm nervous about most of the educational process. So, um, I just, it was like, man, I just got to practice this and I just got to go up and do it. Like, I don't want to take this class again. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, so I, I know it is nerve wracking. I imagine Colin would have been red as a tomato head he perhaps had to do it. Yeah. yeah yeah no it was it was pretty cool Todd, so you killed it i'm sure yeah we were crushing it mm. and it was cool to see like the parents obviously had some questions later on or whatever but even the little kids had had questions they had good they had better questions than we get in our instagram dms yeah because there's a bunch of high school college age kids right. that know everything so they're anonymous and total shit asses yeah. asking stupid shit yeah. yeah exactly no but that's uh i didn't mean to say that that's a small portion of people on social media i'm sure yeah um the cool thing yeah, actually cool. kids are cool man because kids are real it's like yeah. even that crazy fucking maniac bill cosby when he <laughs> when i was a little kid he had a show saying it was called kids say the darndest things yeah and kids and steve harvey did a version of it a few years ago mm-hmm. which i liked and i would watch with my kids when they were younger and it's kid yeah kids are just honest and they don't have like bullshit intent they're not trying to be funny i mean they just yeah. ask you real shit man i love kids yeah, there was a there was a girl there that when I shot unsuppressed, it was a lot for her. And, then and I shot she's like, number one, what kind of conditioner do you <laughs> yeah, use? Yeah, no. Number two, what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. No, so she was she was pretty bummed out at that part. And when she ended up leaving, um, we we know her dad, um, and Colin was walking out with him. And I guess while they were talking, she kept saying she was like, Dad, if we get any guns, you have to get silencers. Like cause she did not like it unsuppressed. So the whole the whole exercise worked um, i mean it saw. makes sense i mean there is it's stupid to shoot without a silence yeah it is and yeah especially it's one part america's gotten wrong so far yeah especially in those indoor ranges too like oh 
Horrible. I, I mean, you can still. I don't know how people do it. You can still have double ear pro or whatever, and it's it's just an uncomfortable. Because most of the time you're in booths next to each other, and those walls are right there. Like even with doubled up ear pro, and it's just uncomfortable. And then to try to introduce your kids into doing that, they're not going to no, want to go awful. back and do it. I mean, I've introduced a lot, you know, over the years. I mean, my 28th year, a lot of kids into firearms with silencers, and a lot of women and. You know, a lot of first timers over the years into guns and with a silencer, all the difference in the world. Yeah. Like it's a hundred times better and different and shooting without a silencer is bullshit. Yeah, it sucks. Um, That's great. So a great event. You guys great had event. a good time. Uncle Todd's doing good. Great. Yeah. Everyone down there is doing awesome. And yeah. Shout out to them, man. Yeah. Unpossible 15, 15% off some of the tactical yeah. panties and whatever yeah. else they've got. All yeah, the we, things. Uh, we definitely want to do or participate in more of the Raise Them Outdoor. Maybe do them up here and stuff like that. Like It's a really cool yeah. event. Yeah. Because yeah, up here would be good, too. There's, there's a bunch of little uh, yeah. hillbilly kids that yeah. are, uh, we, we could get down here. It was just so stuff. cool to see the turn. Well, I mean. Going into it, and I know she knows better than we do because she does them all the time, but I just anticipated we'd have 20 kids or whatever. Yeah. It would be mostly parents, but it was just under 100 kids, and they were all That's stoked. incredible. Yeah, and all the companies that pitch in that help, like obviously this time it was us, Tactical Distributors, whatever, uh, even Freedom, they all got, like, they leave with information. They leave with, like, a shirt and a hat and a ball and stuff like that, and then they leave with an experience, and then they did it with their parents too, so they can go talk about it for however long. It was just, it was a really yeah, cool thing. Yeah, that's such a great thing. I, yeah. I mean, that's how you get kids into guns. Yeah. You know, for me, it's when I love having the interns and stuff at the office. It's, uh, you know, from, yeah, I love that. We want to get kids interested in guns, but for me, the interns at the office are within engineering. Like, yeah. we need kids to grow up to want to design guns yeah. here. We don't want to be buying our guns from China. Yeah. And it was free, too. That was the other thing. It was all free. It's awesome. Just sign yeah, up. Yeah, we can do up. those events here. I mean, that's a cost to us, but it's not a huge cost. But well, how many kids did any of them talk to you about the Honey Badger Call of Duty or anything? Like, how the, many kids are into it because of video games? There were a couple of kids that I talked to that had heard of the Honey Badger because of Call of Duty, but they didn't know what it looked like. Um, like, they mm. didn't realize that it was that. So they were young mm. enough that they couldn't just, like, go on their own and do research, or they just didn't oh, go on their yeah, own and do yeah, research. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, but, yeah, if you ask them, have you heard of the Honey Badger? Like, yeah, Call of Duty. So so they already kind of had an interest, I guess, toward guns or yeah. into guns, but there were so many kids, like, there were a couple that were um, like Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or whatever that had, had shot BB guns or whatever, but they had never shot real guns. And then for them to go, like, the, the photo, that there's a five-year-old girl who had... I don't even think she'd ever seen a gun um, for her to shoot 22s all day and crush it and then shoot the honey Man. badger in the in the sugar weasel like it was awesome that's awesome and she's uh, and the it, smallest human <laughs> oh five-year-old girl yeah uh well I just want to God, thank those parents and applaud them for bringing yeah. your kids out for that that's fucking awesome Man. yeah it this was, is the part that makes me hope we're not losing America oh yeah there was a a mom that I talked to there who she was like yeah but we saw her and her her daughter looked like she was having a ton of fun and she's like yeah she's never even seen a gun in person her daughter was a little older maybe like eight um and she was like she's never seen a gun in person and on the way to the event she was kind of nervous yeah and she's like just listen to what they well, have I to say i would have been terrified when i was a kid yeah she's like just listen to what they tell you and just do what they say and, and you'll have fun and she did and she was stoked so that's so awesome it was really cool so that, it wasn't just that's dads so and great sons. yeah because i wasn't introduced to firearms till i was a teenager yeah Oh, man, I would have loved that. That's I was awesome. surprised at how many moms and daughters showed up. It wasn't just dads and sons. That shocks me, too. Yeah, it was really You know, cool. I, I do see, and you probably see it, too, in our social media and in the, in the DMs. Like, I feel, like, especially recently, it's probably because of the holidays and they're wanting stuff for their, their men. But we get, like, a DM every day from a woman. Yeah. Which is shocking to me. Yeah, it is weird. And I always think it's, like, a fake account. And then I click on <laughs> I it. Know, and I see I they have too. however many followers. I'm like, oh, that's well, I weird. See Melanie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, is this a Russian robot? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's cool. Okay. Well, I want to talk about uh, an experience that I recently had where I made, because, you know, I shoot a lot. I'm training a lot. Yeah. We got some good stuff. Yeah. And so I expect to do well when I go hunting or shooting. Right. But I want to talk about a recent situation where I made the absolute... Worst shot I've ever fucking made in my life. <laughs> really? Um, well, kind of. Um, but I want to talk about an experience. Um, I just posted it on social media mm -hmm. about going to Africa. So before you guys came over, 
on our recent trip to Africa, which hopefully we'll be getting that footage. Mm, we don't know yet. Um, where I went to Mozambique before I met you guys in South Africa, yep. and I went on a lion hunt. Yep. Two weeks or something? Yep. And it was 15 days, and I know it was 15 days because it was very fucking hot because that's closer to the equator, and it's summer over there. Yes. Whoo! Uh, but I, all I know is after my head peeled like four times, yeah. I have the smoothest skin now. <laughs> it's like it's baby soft. I'm looking sun good. Po- I'm feeling good. Little sun poisoning. Woo, yeah, it's good little, for you. Yeah, it's good for you. It makes you tough. Yeah. Um, but I want to talk about that experience and why I did it. And, you know, hunting is an interesting thing to me. It's something that I've grown. And every day I grow more and more passionate about it. And I've been hunting for about 15 years or so. Uh, I grew up in the city, did not grow up hunting, didn't grow up with firearms. And even the first 10 years I was into hunting, I didn't understand. And even now I'm still, and I hope this is one of the things almost like firearms, but even more so where I think you're a student of it your entire life, Mm. you know, and I'm learning more and the more I learn, the more excited I get about it. And I want to share it and I want to share the experiences. But I think one thing that's important and like something that I'm passionate about is I want to experience like all aspects of it. And you know, it's easy with anything that you're into to go do the thing you want, but doing the things that you're not sure about or that you don't know that you want to do, or you don't understand. Those are usually, I think like the scariest things. And I find at this point in my life, I don't know at 47, you know, I'm sure it's some midlife thing or like after the middle of my life thing, where I'm viewing things differently and I want to be challenged in different ways and I want to understand all these things. And it's just been a fucking incredible experience. So like, as you know, now like I'm building a house in South Africa yep. and um, so I've dedicated at least like the next decade of my life to spending some time there and experiencing these things. So anyway, so oh, Rad Robertson. Good guy. Yeah. Good guy. PH of the week um, for <laughs> like seven weeks ago. Um, So when I originally went with Field Ethos to Crusader Safaris, um, Rad was matched up with us. They do like a little personality thing. and They match you with your pH, believe it or not, which makes a ton of sense. And they matched Jason and I with Rad. And that was great. Now Rad is one of my best buddies. We get along great. We hunt together. And, you know, that's an interesting thing. Like if you dedicate yourself to hunting, your guide or your pH that you're with a lot, that's a lot of bonding that goes on there and it creates, you know, the sort of bond that you have with, I don't know, like probably any other friends you spend a lot of time with and hunting a lot of times now, as you know, as you've done some of it is it's, it's like, there's all the things you're nervous, you're preparing, um, you know, maybe you've saved up a bunch of money. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna take something's life. So, so there's this, entire experience that you're sharing with someone and and it does create this bond um so the last time when thomas and i this past summer when we went um because we just released the video uh of the kudu yep and an eight six video so when thomas and i went over to afghan on that hunt at the end there's a place in mozambique that where the biggest lions in africa are and um it's where Cecil the lion was shot. Mm-hmm. And uh, this place, a large piece of property, I think like 40,000 acres, and they get a quota. So the government tells them how many of each animal they can shoot a year. And it's a hunting outfit. And they had they got a quota for two lions. And so in Mozambique, you can't shoot female animals, only the males. And... Um, had a quota for two lions in this place because the lions are so big, they sell out like that. And then, you know, and the customer are are wealthy, uh, mostly American, some European, some Arab, um, you know, usually older businessmen or whatever. And a lion is an expensive hunt. And I learned why, and I want to discuss this entire hunt with everyone, educate everyone on it to the point of the education I have now about it. Um, so it was sold out and we were there and um the, the family that owns this property crusader safaris takes people there um every year 
for like animals or experiences they don't have in South Africa, lying being one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, because they have all the dangerous five. They have, on, in this property in Mozambique, they have, you know, rhino, hippo, elephants, lions, um, you know, buffalo. They've Dragon got leopard. everything. And um, You got leopards? They have leopards, yeah. yeah. They have leopards, they have cheetah, they have everything. Yeah. Mm, they don't They don't have tigers because those aren't in Africa. No. But they've got, they've got all the other things. Well, what's cool, you know, Crusader is... Almost all the hunting with Crusaders free range, which I enjoy a little more because then you kind of learn the deal when you go on a bunch of high fence hunts. It's like kind of a setup. You're definitely going to shoot it. They yeah. pin raise stuff. And I'm not against any of that. Anything gets anybody into hunting because I also know now that conservation, all the conservation is paid for by hunting. Mm-hmm. And so it makes me more open to all the different types of hunting. But anything that can get anyone into hunting is is fine with me. Anyway, so there were these two lion hunts at this property, and they sell out instantly every year. Every year, this family gets the quota that when the government tells them how many hunts they have for a lion or for elephant or whatever, they sell out instantly. And it's it's kind of like we were talking earlier about uh, off camera about the knife community mm-hmm. and yeah. like custom knives, kind of the same way. It turns yeah. into like this lottery thing. You're like, so anyway, when Thomas and I were there. Rad was uh, talking about he had just been with one of his clients up on a buffalo hunt where they killed like, you know, 10 buffalo because they have free range buffalo. They'll have herds of hundreds and it's pretty it's pretty cool. And so he's talking about all the time, talking about like the lions, how big they are. They hunt. um, I don't know if Rad had ever hunted a lion there, but he's hunted leopard there and stuff. And, you know, that's a cool hunt and interesting and very different than other types of hunts. Cat hunting is is yeah. interesting and so anyway uh both hunts were sold to americans one guy had already gone earlier in the season and um he had shot uh an old lion on the property and um the second guy about two months before his hunt near the end of the season um he had a heart attack and he's like this uh texas fella um had a heart attack couldn't travel so he couldn't he couldn't go on his hunt. So he lost his deposit, and Rad uh, was just telling me about it. And was like, "Oh my God, this guy's going on a hunt of a lifetime. He just had a heart attack. I'm going to go." And I'm like, "I want to go on that hunt." <laughs> yeah. And because for me, I never like considered hunting a lion, but I also think with the climate here, and as I learn more about how ignorant America is about Africa and how we impose all these rules based on our ignorance, that like one day. You know, there's going to be another Melania Trump that's going to be like, oh, nobody can shoot elephants. Nobody can shoot lion, And, like, we're not going to be able to do that. And I didn't have a desire to shoot a lion, but the more I read about Roosevelt, the more I read about Hemingway, who, we, you know, we just had Patrick, his great-grandson, on the on the podcast. Um, it's like all these adventures. I, I want to experience that. And being there will do that to you, too. Like, you can go shoot planes game all day and then I was like I would imagine as soon as you hear about like oh there's an opening for a lion like just being there you go well I got to do that too like you have to kind of like you got to experience all of Africa or that's how you feel once you're there I, I think so and 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 to me because I never had an interest in giraffe until kind of I learned the conservation aspect mm-hmm. and then it's kind of like well if you come here to hunt and you do this thing it's kind of your part is to do all of this stuff it's 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 a way that I felt anyway and um, I've never felt pressured to do anything there from I would never give in to the pressure of a uh, safari company. But just understanding the conservation aspect and why there are animals in Africa and why hunting is important and what it does um, for the people and to sustain healthy populations of the animals. So anyway, Rad asked me about it, and I was, or he just mentioned it, and I was like, I want to go on that hunt. And he's like, are you sure? You've already been here like three times this year. And I was like, yeah, message him right now. And he did, and they said, oh, well, somebody else. So someone else bought the hunt. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's a bummer. Well, if it falls through, let me know. Of course, a week later, it fell through. The guy couldn't go. And Rad, I'm back in the States, and he's like, you're not going to believe this. You probably can't go because we got to go within the next 60 days or whatever. But he's like, it fell through. The hunt's available if you want it. And I said, absolutely, let's go. And um, it was one of the most difficult. It's the most difficult hunt I've ever been on. 
it was the most education that I probably had in two weeks in my entire yeah. life. And definitely with hunting and conservation. Um, and it was just trying. It was exciting, like exhilarating, like being like you should not be 30 yards from lions. And we ended up 30 <laughs> yards from lions. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it was just fun. And to me, um, one of the most interesting experiences I've had, and I know it's like if you post shooting an elephant or um, a lion especially, those things, like you're going to be crucified yeah. for it. And the people are just ignorant. And then there's the part where, you know, I just don't give a fuck. Yeah. And if it's okay and it's the right thing and I understand it, my hope is that I can like share the story and other people can understand it. And those people who don't take the time to listen, and if you listen and you understand it and you're still against it, I'm cool with that. But there's no way you understand what hunting in Africa is and you're opposed to it. Mm-hmm. You might not want to do it yourself, but if you're a reasonable fucking human being that's rational, yeah. you're going to understand the importance and, and why it's critical for the people of Africa and for all, all the animals and the species. Yeah. Um, so that was the thing. So we thought that the lion hunt may take a week. It took 15 days, yeah, and tough. it was 110 to 120 degrees every day, and you were out in that all day, 12 to 14 hours day, and it's summer there, so there is tons of daylight, Yeah, and um, so part of that was horrible, but also the silver lining, like there isn't everything, was I spent 15 days, 12 to 14 hours a day with two experienced African PHs and Alex McDonald from McDonald Safaris where we went on their family land in Mozambique has been his grandfather started their company. He's been in this in his entire life and he's only 30, but he's been a PH. He's been a PH for 12 years hunting dangerous game which is experience most most African PHs don't have. He, mm-hmm. He's um, hunted 50 lions, um, where Rad has been on lots of these hunts, yeah. and he's hunted a dozen lions, and yeah. Rad's in his mid-30s. Yeah. So I got to be with them and the tracker, Kidmore, every day, all day, and then Kidmore also had an assistant tracker, Nicholas who is very young. He's probably your age. So he's been doing it five or six years, but Kidmore is in his forties and was Alex's dad's tracker from the time Alex was five or six years old. He has been on hundreds of lion hunts. And so the experience and the riding around all day and doing this, and and, and I'm going to explain to you what a lion hunt, uh, what a lion hunt takes and, um, what I got to learn from it. So you go on a lion hunt. And f- just before you go there, you were with Rad and John, right? Yeah, so John was the yeah. camera guy. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. so John Forsyth, who's also a PH got for um, Crusader Safaris, he went and he was the camera guy. He's been on a lot of dangerous game hunts as well. Yeah. And, and mostly buffalo. Like even people that hunt dangerous game, like a lot of it is buffalo, hippo, elephant, like lion hunts. Are rare, yeah. And I didn't even really realize that. What is it? Is that car? car yeah. Um. So yeah. So we're riding around every day. So what you do is you're on a huge piece of land, and you have to bait lions. Um, you know it's rare to see lions w- without baiting them and having food for them to come to because a lion sleeps like twenty hours a day, so they're very lazy. They sleep. And uh, they're nocturnal, nocturnal, but they'll also move during the day to eat. They'll eat, they'll eat two or three times a day. But it was late in the season, so it was very hot there, 110 to 120 degrees every day, um, which is hot from someone living yeah. in New Hampshire. Yeah, it sucks. And, and um, so the lions also, when it's hot, they don't feed as much during the day. So it makes it more difficult. And that's part of why it was a 15-day hunt. Um which again, like I hated in a sense because I was getting so exhausted and worn out. But the other part was I learned so much. So I'm so grateful now. Yeah. Um, but what you do is is to bait lions, 
you you have to you, you kill something. So you either go if you want to trophy hunt something or you call something, you shoot a kudu, you shoot a buffalo, um, a water buck, like generally a larger animal because lions are 500, 600 pound yeah, cats, so insane. they eat a lot. Yeah. And uh, you'll kill something big and you'll quarter it and you'll hang one quarter. So, um, you know, like a, a rear leg. Yeah, rear leg and everything up in a tree. And you have to put it up in a tree to where you don't want them to be able to lay there and eat it all. You want them to have to work a little for it. So mm-hmm. stand up and get to it. And that's just so they don't eat it all in one setting. Right. Because they're also like pretty lazy. So you hang it to like up in a tree to where they have to stand up and reach like this. So that's generally eight to 10 feet. Like lion is a huge yeah, animal. You know, like we think like a, if you think a bobcat or a mountain lion is a big animal. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, and so you do that and then you have to cover it with, so you have to do it with cable because the lions are so strong and then you have to cover it with branches. So the vultures don't come and land on oh, it and yeah. just pick at it. So you cover it and then you take the guts and you have a gut bucket so which is like a big barrel a a 30 or 50 gallon barrel in the back of the truck and when you kill these animals you pour all the guts and blood and into like everything in it it is 110 degrees jay it does not smell good in that truck not for a minute i heard john reference it a few times on our hunt of driving around with the gut bucket for two yeah yeah i mean rad this is all he does and i saw him dry heave like 10 times (laughs) and it's gross yeah but so you keep it in the bucket with a top on it. But what you do, you bait it, and then you throw some of the guts on the outside, and then you take some of the intestines and all, and you dip it and all the the guts and the shit and the blood, mm. and you tie it either to your belt loop and you walk to drag it away to cross um, trails and roads that lions because lions will walk on the dirt roads and they'll walk on the you know trails and stuff. So to cross that to then pick the scent up and go right to it. Or you drag it with a vehicle, mm-hmm. you know, and like lion covers a lot of territory. So you drag it a couple miles yeah. and, um, this is what you do. You set up, depending on how big the property is, you find good sites where you're, uh, likely to encounter lions. And mostly you try to find where they bed and water. Yeah. So somewhere in between, in between there yeah. and, and you do this. And so at one time we had 12 sites, 12 bait sites. And normally you would only do like three or four, but again, late in the season. Right. And we're trying hard. And uh, and I paid for the pre-bait option. So what that does is they bait several days before you get there. And mm-hmm. once you get lions on bait, 99% of the time, they'll stay there. Yeah. Um, you know, they'll eat and then they will lay down next to it. Or they may go lay down a few hundred yards away, right. but they're <coughs> they're close proximity. So this is what consists of. So it consists of shooting animals, quartering animals, saving all the guts, picking the animals up, you know, skinning them out, cutting the head, like doing all the things, taking them to the bait sites, cabling them up, winching them up in a tree, or pulling it by hand. Somebody has to climb the tree. They got to tie it all up. You cut branches off trees every day to cover the bait once it's hanging. Um, like it's a tremendous amount of work. Mm. And what was interesting, like I couldn't believe it. Like it's an it's an expensive hunt, yeah. and that's not like a, some sort of brag or no. humble brag or flex. It's like just to let you know. And I had ten people for 15 days their entire job was supporting me like this hunt so that means you know you got you got the women from the local village they're um doing everything for you doing the laundry fixing food drinks um just taking care of whatever you need like that you know clean your room making your bed making sure everything's okay because you come back you're exhausted you want to shower and just pass out but then it's 110 degrees so you you sweat while you sleep which is awesome um and so then you have two skinners you have three trackers um you have a chef you know i had the the ph who who in this case because a lion hunts a big deal so the family normally does those and so alex mcdonald was with us the entire time because they take so much care and consideration into this like the lion hunt and ask me questions whenever because i'm just gonna like spew all this stuff that i learned yeah 
um, you know, because I thought, oh, you know, lion hunt, get him on, whatever. So we, um, you don't shoot lions out of a pride. Mm-hmm. So you have to find lions only live to ten years old in the right. wild, unless they're in like Kruger National Park yeah, or somewhere yeah. where they have a stress free life. And like Cecil was fourteen, right? That's like a circus lion. Um, <laughs> yeah. So lions live to ten. So you want to shoot lone males that aren't in a pride and that are over six years old. Right. And that's why they have the quality of lions that you can go there and shoot. And that's why, like, the biggest lions are shot on this property because right. they don't shoot babies. This isn't pen raised. You know, one thing I learned is, like, uh, if you see a lion with big flowing mane, like the MGM lion, like, that's a pen raised lion. Yeah. It's not a lion in the wild. If you ever see one that has the hair, the tufts in front of their back legs, like on Instagram now, I see a lot of that. That's a pen raised lion. That's not a wild lion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and any rich guy can go in two days, shoot a pen raise lion. They raise them in pins. They let them out. You shoot them. And, right. And that's probably some part that disgusts people. I, I'm not opposed to that because I know where the money in goes and it goes to the communities and it goes to conservation. So I think that's fine because if it weren't for this, people hate it. There would be no lions on the planet. Right. They would all be extinct. Um, if it weren't for people going to hunting and I'm going to explain that, but. Um, fuck. Where was I? Oh, uh, you were on a lion hunt in Mozambique. No, uh, you were mm. talking about you had just finished basically a day to day. What goes into it? You had a bunch of people supporting the operation. Yeah. So, well, I'll tell you. So, a basic day on the lion hunt is you get up before daylight, which is the latest I got up any day in fifteen days was five thirty. I generally got up at four a.m. You get breakfast on the way out. Four thirty, you're driving. Yeah, sucks. and we would come back at about six thirty, sometimes seven o'clock. And um, it's already you're sweating by then. Was it where you were? Because I know you stayed at a, at a lodge as well. Was it similar to Crusader, where yeah, your drive is only whatever half hour out into whatever twenty minutes into where well, you're actually hunting? Well. We were on the property we were hunting, but right. the property is so vast. Yeah. Like our first bait was probably 15 minutes okay. from the lodge, and the farthest one was about an hour away. Yeah, so similar to yeah. Crusader. So like Crusader, you're yeah. on you're on the property, but it can be far. Right. Yeah, it could take you forever. Yeah. Um, and so we go out in the morning. We go check the bait, and you set a trail camera up at every bait. Right. You look at the bait. And if something's been on it, you check and you can, you know, tell because the limbs are knocked down and there's meat gone. Um, You check the tracks, you check the cameras, and then you you start to see, like, what's on. Is it a leopard? Is it a jackal? Um, Is it a um, uh, hyena? Oh, right. So hyena and leopard and lion are generally the things that are getting on the bait. Sometimes it can be other stuff, but those are the general things. <clears throat> and sometimes it looks like, oh my God, you're pulling up, all the limbs are knocked down, everything, and you check the trail camera, it's just a oh, elephant went by, oh, and yeah. they are destructive just motherfuckers. Knock they knock down. everything yeah. down. And um, and sometimes a tree get pushed over the baits in. The lions will push up, or uh, elephants will push a whole tree over just to eat one limb. You know, like a tree that's grown for 60 years. Yeah. They push it over, gnaw on one limb, walk off like they're assholes. Yeah. Um, so they're they're very very destructive. Um, do hyenas have a season? Do people shoot hyenas? Yeah, you can shoot hyenas. This particular property, they don't have quota, but they're supposed to get it next year. Yeah. Um, you know, a problem with it is, and and the property's not getting quota isn't generally um, a sign that there might not be animals to shoot. It's just that the government is underfunded or uninterested, yeah. and like. And there's weird shit with every country, like America. Silencers being regulated is weird. In Mozambique, you can't own a twenty two long rifle. It's illegal. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there's all kinds of weird shit. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, it was a Portuguese colony. Mm-hmm. And so the they declared that you can't hunt roan, clip springer, and uh, some other animal there. So And sometimes... Like, they don't get quota for, war, like, I saw the biggest warthogs in my life. Like, oh, my God. And I saw probably, I saw water buck there, which I love water buck. I was like, holy shit, they're bigger than South Africa. I was like, when you shoot a water buck, 
They're like, no, we don't have a quota this year. Damn. And I was like, and we saw this one water buck, and um, Alex, very knowledgeable and very into conservation at uh, McDonald Safaris. And, and uh, I was talking to him and Red, and I'm like, I've seen maybe 500 water buck. Like, I've seen more. I've seen a lot. I'm still an American idiot hunter. Mm-hmm. But I know enough now to know when I see something old or I see something ginormous or whatever. And I was like, guys, what is the world record water buck right now? And they're like 37 inches. And I'm like, how big is that water buck right there? <laughs> and they go, 37 yeah. inches. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. So they're hoping to get, like, quota for water buck next yeah. year. But I've shot some big water buck on Crusader Safari with free range. Mm-hmm. Like, this was next level stuff. Well, think about even that, too. Like, about as far as people not they just think that people are just going out wild and shooting random animals or whatever but no the government private yeah this is private land and the government is still regulating what you can and cannot yes and and not only they give you the number but then some years they'll tell you can't shoot certain animals and and sometimes like it makes sense but i think any real hunter or conservationist like you don't ever want to shoot the animals out no and you only want to shoot like wounded sick old mature past their prime or you know, there's nothing wrong with trophy hunting. People say that like it's a negative connotation. But normally, the trophy is the biggest and oldest one. Right. And, like, harvesting that animal is not bad. No, it's only it's not bad for a herd. The younger ones can move up. You get more genetics. Because normally in a herd, the dominant animal is going to breed all the others. So that's right. the only genetic you're getting for several years. Right. And when I was getting back to like, you don't hunt a lion out of a pride and some people do that and it's shitty. And, and I didn't understand, but I've learned the problem is not a pride. There's always a lot of females because you know, the, they're, they're breeding the females. That's how we get cubs. Um, but also the females are the workers. They're right. the ones that yeah, hunt. They hunt. Yeah. They do all the stuff. The males don't do a lot, but there's typically two, three, four males in a pride. And there's always cubs. Mm-hmm. We didn't see any prides without cubs. And I paid, I was talking earlier about the pre-bait option where you pay them to start baiting the lions and it hopefully can shorten your hunt up when you get there. Right. And um, they pre-baited the day I got there, the afternoon we go the first bait, there's like eight lions. Oh. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be so easy. I'm going <laughs> to shoot a lion tomorrow. And we see one um, that is a shooter. They want you to shoot lions inside of 100 yards Mm -hmm. because most people are nervous and like you don't want to chase a wounded 500 pound cat. Yeah. Like there's all these things. And, you know, and and in hunting, like things are going to go wrong, but you don't ever want to wound an animal. Um, So the first day we go, when I get there, we go out to check a bait that they had pre hung and there's eight lions there. And I'm like, oh my God. And they start. And, and they don't run when they see you. Like, a lion is a very brazen animal. Mm-hmm. And what you, it's so funny because what you have to be careful of, actually, like, the males, they're not going to really fuck with you too much unless they're cornered. They're just lazy, so they'll meander off. But, like, a female lion, especially if she has cubs and she's on some bait, will fight you. Yeah. And so that's, like, the ones that – those that's generally what kills people. And um, that you need to be really – weary of and it, you know of course to me never really being around lions in the wild like this isn't this isn't like some high fence hunting camp no. like we're in remote africa in the wild and there are lions there and i am so nervous because yeah. i'm like man being eaten by a, like a bear or a shark or a lion seems like the worst thing small part of my brain i am horrified and uh you know and by the 15th day i'm like <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, you know, yeah. you just get over it. Yeah. Um, but I tell you, hearing a lion roar, even from hundreds, half a mile away, you feel it in your chest, mm-hmm. and it makes the hair, if I had any, on like the back of my neck, stand up. You get goosebumps, and you stop and you wait, and it's just like it's, it's just like I said, in a little part of your brain, man. Like a lion is no joke, and that roar is horrifying i believe it like it is more so than you know like they told me when we started hunting buffalo and i love that now like you know i'm not tough but i ain't afraid of buffalo 
I'm just not like I'm not going to be stupid around them. Right. But if I got a gun, yeah, and I'm not going to get myself in a situation. But a lion, I think you could shoot 500 lions. You're going to be terrified every time. Like a buffalo, we we go up in America. We go up around like cattle, or you know, I grew up around cattle and you know seeing them and bulls and like whatever yeah like i know not to mess with it but i'm not like afraid it's gonna jump a fence and like drag me up a tree and a eat cow me. or a bull or a buffalo they're not an obligate carnivore they don't their only mission isn't to kill a cat it's only yeah it's only thing it needs to do is kill things and eat it yeah it kills stuff and eat it yeah. like a bull eats grass yeah it's like it's yeah. very different and they don't have those claws and they're not right. like super fast and jump stuff and yeah. oh Oh, cats. We saw him do some crazy shit I when we were there. So anyway, so we, we roll up the first day. There's like lions everywhere. I'm like, oh, my God, this is so easy. No wonder it's like expensive to come here and it's so great. There's like lions everywhere. So I think in, oh, three days, we're going to be on the beach in Mozambique at Rad's family's beach house, like snorkeling, having, you, you know, mimosas and fucking off. Did not go down like that. No. So it was so hot. And so anyway, that afternoon, we see Alex's dad. He was kind of retired now, and he's probably about my age, a couple years older. Been doing this his whole life. And he says, oh, you know, it's introduced himself and all. And we're talking. He's like, oh, you guys got lion on bait? Oh, yeah, we just saw him. He goes, oh, okay, well, it's a done deal. You get lions on bait, it's done. I was like, oh, that's great. Great news because I want to hunt. They have also, it's uh, this place, this area is where the uh, biggest kudu in the world have been killed. Right, yeah. And so I wanted to hunt kudu. <coughs> Excuse me. And they have one popo bushbuck, which is different than the bushbuck that we hunt on the Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to hunt those. Like in my mind, I'm like, oh, we're going to get this lion thing done. And then we're going to do these other things. We're going to the beach. We're going to go fishing. Ah, going to meet up with you guys in South Africa. It's set. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. No. Well, because that's, it's crazy because even they were up leading up until you were already over there, leading up until when we left, we we hadn't heard from you about i mean we'd hear from you periodically but not once did we hear about a lion so we were all thinking like i wonder if he shot anything and then up until the day we left we were like maybe he like maybe he missed one and he doesn't want to tell us or something <laughs> and then as soon as we landed and uh and andrew and seppi picked us up andrew was like kevin got a lion and we're like whoa so it was cool but yeah. i mean it took you that it took you the entire time well it did and we never i didn't take a shot until i killed the one i killed yeah. um you know, and there are several things, but I learned so much. And now I learned how much hunting is like bullshit, too. I kind of think like gun companies where they'll tell you certain things and it just it ain't real. Yeah. And uh, there's a most lions shot in Africa are pin raised. Mm -hmm. um, going in the wild and hunting a lion is rare and it's unique. And um, I didn't even really know this when I signed up. I learned so many things and I'm so excited. Had we not killed a lion? I would be disappointed, but I would be so excited about how much, like I got a master's degree in this yeah. two weeks, man. Yeah. It was so fun and it was so interesting. And so like a couple of days after Alex and I get to know each other and I'm comfortable, you know, we're just hanging out all day. I mean, we're working, but we're together and they would ask me stuff about guns a lot. Cause of course they're into guns. And, um, uh, actually Alex's grandfather, his last name is lot. He developed the 458 lot cartridge, oh. which is very popular in Africa yeah. for dangerous game. It's probably one of the three most popular calibers and that's his grandfather. And so, um, he is a cool guy. You know, I love being with rad. He's like a brother and yeah. we're just hanging out fucking off John Forsyth. You know, he's, he's, awesome. with, he's yeah. so funny. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and he knows Rad and, and he's getting to know me. So he's videoing all the time because he know Rad's going to, he knows yeah, Rad's yeah. going to say some crazy shit. Um, but I learned so much and then understanding, well, we're not going to shoot any lions that are under six years old mm -hmm. and you don't hunt one out of a pride. And I'll get back to that because there'll be several male lions. There's always cubs and you never know because it's not always the oldest, which is the, uh, like the do the alpha yeah the the, the the dominant lion of the pride and it could so it might be the one of the younger ones that's the father of the cubs but if you shoot the wrong one if you shoot one if you shoot the father of the cubs the other male lions instantly kill the attack cubs. the cubs mm -hmm. and kill them all yeah and sometimes the the lionesses um if they're pregnant mm -hmm. um so it's it's a fucked up thing 
And so you just don't like being responsible. You don't shoot a lion out of a pride. Right. And when we rolled up the first day and there were lions on bait, that was a pride. Mm-hmm. And there was, there were at least there was one, probably two shooters in there, but you just don't do it because right. there were cubs as right. well, you know, and like you can never post even a picture with cubs because people don't want to know the reality of things. But so we're doing that. The lions disappear. And we put up a lot of bait, so fast forward, so I don't make this story too long, over the course of a week or so, we're putting baits up everywhere. We get some leopards, we're getting some lions, sometimes just at night, sometimes they're too young, and so as the time goes on, um, you know, I, I have to shoot animals for bait for this. And so I, I'm talking to Alex about what quota they have left near the end of the season, and what and and lions also love zebra. So mm-hmm. I shot a couple of zebra, and zebra is like a ginormous fat horse, and yeah. a lot of meat, and they've got like this yellow fat. And a lot of people don't like the meat; like it's fine to me, mm-hmm. um, but lions love that meat. And so, so I shot a couple of those, and we have a lot of baits up, and it's so hot the bait's not lasting long. Yeah, and one day I go to shoot. Uh, a buffalo and I saw one I post a picture of it broken horn this old um cape buffalo that is just incredible and um he's in the last couple of years of his life he's all worn down and that's like what I like yeah and um so we, we see him and we go over this side of this mountain and we're tracking back up to because we're in the vehicle when we saw him and so if you stop the vehicle they fuck right off yeah and um and you don't want to educate them on the vehicles. These are wild animals. So if you shoot something from the vehicle or you're riding, get out of the vehicle and shoot them. The others do that. And even buffalo, you don't want to shoot in a herd. Mm-hmm. You look for lone males or when they're in a group of two or three. Because if you shoot in a herd, if you wound it, it goes into like the herd of 300. Yeah. You can't see them. And they're very protective. Yeah, cover, yeah, it's like the wildebeest. They cover each other. Yeah, up. so you'll lose it or you'll get fucked up trying to get it. So you don't ever shoot one out of a herd. And so we found something that i wanted and we needed bait so we go over the mountain we're hiking up the mountain <clears throat> and we get to the edge of the thick stuff on the back side we've got good wind where uh the buffalo are and as we start to go in it's open and then it's just dense thick stuff and this is where it's scary with mm. buffalo yeah because you're not paying attention you don't see them and they will fuck you up this is how you get killed but we're walking the trail we got to walk on this little animal path that's half as wide as this table yeah for a good ways and as soon as we step into it rad looks down sees a giant lion track mm. fresh like yeah just before us and it's one of the rare parts of the property where it's kind of sandy and you could see good tracks anyway we go in we shoot the buffalo uh that's a whole nother story so we'll get into it so we go to get the trackers and we bring them right to where we saw the lion track. And so they leave um, somebody to, to basically to gut the buffalo and everything. We start tracking the lion tracks. So we go about a mile and a half, and they're on it. And so we have two trackers with us um, who are experienced. And they're, tra- they're bent over just walking, looking at these tracks and all, and they get to a – place and they kind of split up for a minute after about a mile or so and it's kind of an open area and they split around a little thicket and then uh kid Moore went this way he comes back and they're like it's this direction they're like it's at least two and we're like hmm because you, you know uh sometimes the male lines will be alone if they're not in a pride and sometimes they're in a bachelor group right. of two or three four lines and you can shoot one out of that you just don't shoot out of like a, cubs, a pride yeah, yeah with females and so they're going and they're looking down, tracking. All of a sudden, they're like 30 yards ahead of us. They both fall on their backs at the same time and start crawling backwards. And we're like, Alex, like, they found lions. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he knew the posture right away. And uh, we go to them. They get back to us. When they get to us, they just say they're under that tree. And they go back like 100 yards yeah. and they're hiding. Yeah. And we look and we're... You know, at this point, we're probably 40 yards from them. There's three. Well, we thought it was two at first, two lions sleeping under a tree in the shade. Mm. And so 110, 20 degrees there in the shade. We set up, and then we realize 
well, Alex says we're too close. We need to back up. And I was like, really? I was like, three of us have guns. He's like, yeah, they're lions. Yeah. Let's yeah. back up. Yeah. So we back up to like 60 yards and we get a the little bit of cover that's out there. Three hours standing in the sun. Watching. Is that the video of the ones that you posted? Those is that Was, was that those three? <laughs> it's, oh. Yeah. And it's yeah, also sitting the video where Rad's behind me and like smoking a cigarette. Oh, like yeah. we had the wind and everything. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Smoking a cigarette. We're like hunting lions. He's like, yeah, we got the yeah, wind. Wind's blowing that way. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, and he's right. It's like basically if a lion smells your cigarette, smoke smells you. So it's yeah. like. So it's so interesting watching them sleep. Like one of them is spooning a tree. Like oh, a yeah. big oak tree, or I don't know what yeah, kind of tree. They're kind of oak. Like oak. And <laughs> yeah. It's spooning this tree. And then another one, it was like having vivid dreams. And we could only see part of them, so we couldn't age them. Mm. Because it's tough to age a lion um, right. in a certain area. Like you don't want to shoot one when it's in its prime. You want to shoot one when it's in the last few years of its life. And, and so Alex has to age. Like no matter what happens, you don't shoot unless one is charging you. Unless he tells you to shoot. Right. Like, you don't get to pick what lion you want. Because he wants to maintain, you know, the healthiest herd and people to harvest the best lions. Every, and those are the older ones. And um, so another one, it was funny. It was So then we realized there's three. Once we get, like, a different vantage point, that there's three. And we're like, holy shit, everybody keep your eyes open looking around. Because who knows? Right. Like, we're in this area. There are lions. It could be, like, one twenty yards from us. We don't see... So anyway, we see it. There's three, but one of them, it was so funny because it was sleeping and it was like dreaming apparently because it oh, was yeah. laying there and all of a sudden it would like stick its legs yeah, up in the move, air yeah. and then roll over and then like fight and roll over. So it was kind of funny watching that. So this went on for hours and finally one of them sits up and I'm thinking this is go time. Like we're going to mm-hmm. shoot. It sits up just like a cat, like on its butt, uh, front paws down. And it's broadside, and I'm on some sticks, mm-hmm. and I had been for three hours, and I'm pretty sure. And like, like, what do I know about lions? It's a huge cat. Yeah, it yeah. looked, it had a big, like, it looked old to me. Like, what do I know? And um, this, and this was, well, this is probably within the first week, but um, so I think he's gonna say to shoot. So in the video, you can hear me like take, my, yeah. like, click the safety off, and. Uh, and before this, he had said, when they get up, you do not shoot unless I say shoot. Mm-hmm. Fucking deal. And um, it stretches and it looks right at us. It never smelled us or anything. It's just right. like we weren't there when it fell asleep. Yeah. And it looks right at us. And, man, he didn't tell his homies or anything. He bolts. <laughs> and you can see in the video. Yeah. And then his homies, like, get up. And they're like, what the heck? And they're looking around. I could have shot both them, too. And uh, they fucked right off with him after that. And I was like, did I do something wrong? Like, did I bump the... And he's like, no, they're probably five. They're a year or two too young. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really interesting. Yeah. That we, like, actually tracked them and found them and saw them and yeah, waited I for say them to get up. That was probably the end of the first week or beginning of the second week that you were there because we finally saw that video because you had posted that video. And I was like, we hadn't seen anything. Then we saw that, but we saw you didn't shoot. So we're like... Ah, oh, maybe that's the only lines they saw or something. So. <laughs> but but we knew like oh we still got a week left. So yeah. Well, I mean, in the end, once it got so they never had a lion hunt take more than ten days. Wow. And so I think you know they're getting nervous. So like it's a lot of money and they don't want to disappoint. But right. they're also like I got so much respect to them because they're like adhering to what they should do. Right. Yeah. They're not, uh, not cutting to, corners. Yeah. And they're not gonna. If we don't shoot, and I tell you, they were so awesome. I bet if we hadn't shot a cat, they would tell me to come back this next year and right. shoot. Like, it's still a hunt. Yeah. And, excuse me. So, this is like one price. So, they weren't getting a day rate. So, it was just costing them money for this hunt to go right. on. And you, you know what was interesting that I learned? Um, that people don't understand where this is really great is – all the people that supported me there, except for Alex, are from the local community. Mm-hmm. My hunt, what they got paid from my hunt, is half the money they make all year. From like, one so, hunt. So those people in that village, you know, so there were, I think, seven of them for me, for my hunt. And it was part of my package. And then, of course, I tipped them. And, um, you know, me being a straight baller, they told me <laughs> what I should tip them. And I tipped them 50% more. Yeah. 
um, and everybody did an awesome job. But it's interesting to know, like, it is, it's strange, like, us being Americans and knowing everything and being so arrogant. It's like, I'm in the middle of Africa. There is no reason for these people to live there, first of all. Yeah. It's just where their community's been forever, and it's where they live. There's nothing for them to do other than raise cattle and sheep and grow corn and eat. Yeah. And hunting provides the school there, and it provides all of the money that they get. And, you know, it's the jobs for them. And this isn't a big community, but it is one of the communities out in this area. And they have a chief. So it's kind of like, you know, the leader of the community. And it's, uh, you know, an inherited position and everything. Yeah. And um, he makes the decisions. And they have a deal with them. Because this is actually an interesting property. And I spoke about it on an earlier podcast. So they, they, this village used to be on this hunting property. And there was a tremendous amount of... Because it is, it's near Kruger Park, and there's a tremendous amount of animal community conflict, yeah. and that's a couple things. The two things that really bother the community, elephants, because they're so destructive. So if they plant an acre of corn, like elephants will eat it all in one day. Yeah, that's insane. And, and so then these people starve, and then they're raising cattle and sheep, and if the lions are eating all of their cattle and all the sheep... Because it's easy food. Because they yeah. lions basically have all this food that's in a pen. Yeah. And um, so what the community does, lions have zero value to them without hunting. So yeah. what they do is snare all the lions and the elephants, and, they, and they kill them. Yeah. So all the lions would be dead if it weren't for hunting. There would be no lions in Africa. And, you know, part of conservation, people think, oh, you know, lions or elephants are endangered in Africa. And it is such bullshit. They should kill 500 elephants on that one piece of property. Yeah. They, after what I saw, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, but it would be like saying there are no elk in Florida, so elk are endangered right. in America. Yeah. Like, that's stupid. Yeah. Um, yeah, we Afri- don't have iguanas here. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're endangered. Yeah. I mean, you think about what we are talking about before the podcast, like me being from Georgia. Whitetail were eliminated in, well, on the East Coast and from georgia by indigenous people and they were reintroduced you know about the time i was born actually into georgia and now there's such a population every person can shoot 10 every year and so i think if people think about it like that like africa is huge and there are places where there are no lions there are places where the population is very small and you should not hunt them and you don't hunt them and there are places where lions need to be shot now you don't need to wipe them out, but through hunting, you can provide for the community. You can manage the population because if you like seeing kudu in every other plains game, impala, zebra, like you have to manage the lion population because the lion's only predator is a human. Right. You know, like you see lions get fucked up by a buffalo when they go after like a calf yeah. sometimes, but, um, you know, there's nothing that hunts the lions. And so, um, but what the community was having was this situation. And so the McDonald family worked with the government and the community. And this isn't great farming land for them. And um, the, the land beyond there that the McDonald's owned is good farming land. Mm-hmm. And this was better hunting land. So they worked with the community, worked with the government. They actually moved the community to own to their land. And the community wanted it better land for them and um they took over this land to hunt and what they did was they built one fence Mm -hmm. to try to separate to so the whole goal was to reduce community animal conflict um because while i was there i mean i'd see some days i would see 200 elephants and the mcdonald's and hunting pays for all the anti-poaching because they have rhinos on their property yeah so every time they get a new rhino they um, call in, so they pay for, and it's a nonprofit thing, but they also pay for it. A helicopter flies from the capital of uh, Maputo, um, which is like two-hour drive, probably thirty-minute helicopter. Flies there with a veterinarian. They dart the rhino. They land. They oh, lance shoes. the horns. Yeah. Um, and you know it's so stupid. Like the poachers, like kill them and like cut half their face off and everything. You can cut it off with a pocket knife. Yeah. And the animal survives and they grow back. Right. 
Um, so you don't even have to kill them, but you know, the poachers, they don't care. They shoot them, kill them, cut the horns off. But on all of those, so there's no hunting of rhinos on McDonald's land, but every time there is a rhino they see that has horns, they dehorn it and they pay for all of it. Yeah. And, uh, so they built this one fence, uh, big fence, it's electric fence to try to keep the lions and the elephants not going into the community. So the property is not high fence, just a border. Uh, from the hunting property to the community and they've reduced like animal conflict by like 95 percent right so now elephants aren't eating all their corn and they're not staring oh while i was there they had um an elephant on the property that's leg was all swollen had a snare on it so it was a snare that a community had put out to like keep the elephants away and they caught one but it broke the cable and got away and its leg was all swollen and infected and uh, a helicopter flew in one day while we were there. They darted the elephant. The elephant falls asleep. You know, they landed. They uh, had a uh, veterinarian on board. He cuts the cable off, and he puts antibiotic on it, gives the elephant, I think, some shots of antibiotic and everything. And the elephant woke up, you know, and staggers away, and now it's going to survive. Like, that infection would have killed that elephant. And its leg and and. And foot, uh, what do you call like an elephant's foot? I don't know. I think it's a foot. Yeah, it's, a foot. A, yeah, it's, it's not a hoof. Right? It's, it's a like foot. twice the size of the other one. And so you know, like they saved this elephant. And to me, I'm like, that's crazy because y'all have so many elephants. Y'all should have just shot that thing. Yeah. But um, and what you don't realize is we're riding around every day, and this is some of the most beautiful property in the entire world. And you would go through some of the plains area. And there would it would look like Armageddon. It looked like if you're from the south, like you've seen tornado damage, and we just saw it like it just happened in Kentucky recently, mm-hmm. and we see it on the news, where the trees are all knocked like broken off at like six feet, ten right. feet in the air, and you would see a hundred acres like that. And Alex was like six years ago. This was all canopy trees. It was beautiful. Leopard, cheetah, everything lived in here. Kudu. Um, it was beautiful property. And you would sometimes pull in here, like in the shade, and have lunch during the day or whatever. Every tree is broken. It looks like Armageddon. It looks like the fucking moon. It's horrible. And I'm like, what the fuck happened? You guys have tornadoes? He's like, no, that's all elephant damage. And I'm like, what? He's like, you'll see. And he's right. Every day we would see an elephant push a tree over to eat one root, one limb and walk off. So and crazy. they, and they would break them and nonstop, probably 10 times during this two weeks, we had to stop and, uh, they had broken a tree across a uh, road and we had to move the tree or cut it up or whatever. I mean, it's, they are so destructive. It's incredible. And he's like, people don't understand. It's like, um, he says, it's really kind of Africa's gotten pressure from America to stop shooting elephants. But he's like, they're so destructive it you know decimates every other population of animals that we have and it's like we could literally kill 500 elephants on this property and he's like we get a quota for five every year yeah i think i read the article i think it was somewhere there maybe it was kruger but they had 18 times the amount of uh elephant just in that area that they can even handle yeah and it and you can't do anything about it they shut down elephant hunting and i'm going to get all these numbers wrong but in botswana and they're just opening it back up, but I think they need to cull 80,000 elephants. It's crazy. And people think, oh, elephants in danger, don't shoot them. Number one, they're super destructive. Mm-hmm. Um, number two, the populations are huge. But again, it's like Africa is huge. There aren't elephants in some parts of Africa. Right. And the populations aren't big in some parts. You don't hunt them there, but you need to hunt them where they thrive like this. Because, um, you know, and what's weird and crazy that I learned too, and isn't like public knowledge and culling ele- elephants is very difficult because elephants are smart and they're different than a lot of animals. And you know, you'll have a herd of elephants and if you're going to cull elephants, you have to cull the herd, right. the entire herd. Right. So basically you ambush them or from a helicopter and you shoot everyone, the cows, the bulls, the adolescents, the babies. And there is some age of elephant between like baby adolescent that they take when they do this, and those are the ones that you see in the circus. Oh, yeah. Because otherwise, like, it's very traumatic for an elephant if you go and shoot one out of a herd or if you cull and leave some of them. Those are the ones that, like, lose their minds and go into communities and, like, knock down houses and stuff. Like, they just lose their shit and go crazy, and you have to kill them. Yeah. So that's why they kill, like, 
if you're going to cull elephants, which you have to do, mm-hmm. so you can either sell hunts, but then you have to cull as well. Um, and you have to get like four or five guys and you kill an entire herd. Right. Because if you leave any, um, it's so traumatic for them. They're devastated and they like lose their minds and they do like crazy stuff. Like, you know, they go, well, maybe it's retribution. They go like, yeah, exactly. into a village and knock down stuff and kill people. Right. Um, so those are generally the elephants. And, and we encountered some elephants when we were hunting other stuff. And like a cow elephant that's got some babies or adolescents is a motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, uh, we almost shot a cow elephant in, in self-defense. We were hunting uh, kudu and bushbuck. And we were on this part of the property where there's a big river. And a part of the river was dry where we were. And we were on the bed of it. We parked the land cruiser. And we had hiked in about a mile or so. When we were coming back, it was late in the evening. It was getting late, you know, it's dusk. And elephants were in the water in the river kind of near us, and which is no big deal. And we go to the truck, and, like, we get a drink, you know, and we're, it's hot as hell, and we'd just been out for a few hours hiking and uh, uh, trying some spot and stalk, and so everybody's thirsty and stuff. And they decide... It's getting getting low light, so they're getting out of the water. They're coming up out of the river, and and no, for whatever reason, they just came up the bank right where we were. Right. And that cow, like this one big cow that had a couple adolescents with it, um, like it freaked her out that the Land Cruiser and we were there, and it it started making noise and turned towards us. Mm-hmm. And we're talking this thing's like thirty yards, and yeah. it's a big animal, and it does a mock charge and everything. And, like, Rad yells for me to get my gun, too. And, like, you know, it's a situation. Like, you never want that. But, like, right. that, that shit happened. So, we almost did shoot an elephant. Yeah. That was, like, um, that video that you posted the other day where they're in that thick stuff. And that elephant came. That guy put two into the elephant. Oh, yeah. He waited as long yeah, as he as, could. As he could. And, then yeah, I posted another one where you see it's, like, a photo safari. And the thing turns the Land Cruiser over yeah. people in it. Um, yeah. So... Rad was yelling at it and everything, and then I'm just sitting there having a drink. Yeah, I think, that's oh, like, Rad's come and get it. your fucking gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, now nah, you got it. And I was like, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, but, but no. So I did, and um, you know, I was gonna back Rad up. I mean, he was serious, and and it did a co- it did a, a full on mock charge and kind of a mock mock charge. Yeah, like a like a and and, and, it, and it fucked off, and that was fine. But I thought we were gonna have to kill an elephant. Um. So, you know, some of the lions, we encountered a, a few other lions, and it's getting, you know, it's it's a difficult hunt. It's, like, hot. There's a lot of work. We're shooting other things as bait. We're hanging the bait. We're doing the drags every day. And I could tell about day seven, Alex and Rad are getting a little nervous. And it's like, this is later than they would normally hunt cats, and it's very hot. So the cats are lazy anyway, and they're not moving. And I tell you, the two days before uh, day 15 when we finally shot a lion, I was almost every day. Because, I mean, you think for 31 days, every morning, every afternoon, I'm hunting. Yeah. The only time I didn't hunt was we shot a video in South Africa one afternoon. And, And I don't think I hunted that afternoon. We did that. But otherwise, so you think 31 days, it's 62 hunts for me. Mm -hmm. And man, I'm exhausted. And on like day 13, I'm like, I'm about to call this. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, like man up, tough it out. And it doesn't seem like talking about it. Like it was difficult. No, but, but I mean, was. we didn't do that. It wasn't like when we were all there, it wasn't, there were a couple of days. There was like one or two days where it got to high eighties, low nineties, whatever. And like, and that no one was complaining about the heat, but like you're doing a lot of stuff. It's not going out and sitting in, and your buddy's climber or like your buddy's tree stand and every day for a couple of days like you're no. doing stuff well that it was so funny to me because after this and it was a two-day drive down right. to where you guys were and um that was the most rest that i had the entire time and so funny i get there you guys been there a day like a day and a half yeah and everybody was sunburnt and complaining it was 20 degrees cooler than yeah, where i was yeah. and you guys were like I'm so exhausted. We're yeah. going to bed early tonight. Oh, my God. This is so terrible. Yeah. And I was like, you guys are 20 years younger than me yeah. and huge pussies. Yeah. Um, that sun crushed all of us. Yeah. And it, mean, wasn't it wasn't even hot. It wasn't even <laughs> the heat either. It was just like. Well, it's hotter than here. Well, the first day that I sat up on the back of the truck 
with the tracker and didn't have sunscreen on, just got well, pummeled the stupid. entire day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I learned. <laughs> gotta have a big hat for that. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, um, you know, we're just, we're we're doing this thing. I shot three buffalo. I got trout eight six. So I had a eight six with uh, eleven inch barrel mm-hmm. is the only thing that I shot while I was there. Um. I was using uh, a load that Ethan did with the Hornady Brass. Hornady's making brass for us for the 8.6. I was using the Barn TT SX TTSX, bullet, yeah. which is the tipped one. Is that 210 or is that the 160? It's a 210. 210. And the 160 is good. The The TSX, the non tip 210, is awesome on big animals. I don't like the TTSX quite as much. Um, I, and it makes sense. Like the way the bullet's designed. Um, the hardness of the copper like it's the the non-tipped one is good for big game and then i think the 160 is good if you're shooting kudu or elk or something um but i was using this because ethan's want me to try everything out but 11 inch barrel you know and i i got some of those norwegian silencers Mm -hmm. sent down time so i got to hunt with silencers and they were lightweight and they were great they were just what you need for hunting um so so that was fine but i shot two zebra kudu three buffalo with it um and then eventually the lion yeah so i don't know maybe we're there and then i'll look at my notes and you ask whatever questions you come up but that last day so so i'm like i'm gonna hang in here until they call it and rad had told me he's like look excuse me in the days leading up to this he's like if the boys get there, you guys in yeah. South Africa, and you want to go, we'll charter a plane or we'll drive down, and you do that. And Alex, the McDonald family, has already said, then you come back here, and we're gonna we're gonna do this hunt till we get a line if it takes a month. Yeah. And I was like, man, you know, I don't, I don't know. Like, I didn't even like that idea. Like, there's no guarantee you're gonna shoot a lion in the wild. Right. There's no guarantee you're gonna shoot anything in the wild. Right. And I understood that going into this. And to me, like, I'd have the experience. I understood what it was. I understand why a lion hunt is so expensive or a leopard hunt. Like, it takes a lot. Like, buffalo hunt's expensive, but you can go out and shoot a buffalo. Yeah. Um, You know, finding the right one and all that, that could take time. That could take days. could take weeks. Um, But if you want to shoot a buffalo, you can shoot a buffalo. Yeah. Um, That is not the case with cats. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're going to shoot one. Maybe you're not. I mean, it's like if you want to shoot a 60-inch kudu, if you're like one of those guys that wants to measure everything, this is the place you could shoot a 60-inch kudu. You might do it the first day. It might take you two months to do it. Right, right. And and so that's why I try not to get caught up in any of that stuff. I want the experience of the hunt. And I felt like I'd had the experience, and it was a little disappointing. But we had had great encounters with lions. We had lion on bait. We had an opportunity We just didn't get one that met the criteria that wasn't a pride that was old enough, you know, that was past its prime booted out of a pride, you know, that, you know, it had lived Mm -hmm. and, um, that's what we're after. And I'm like, well, listen, I'll come back and do it again one day. It's all, it's all good in the hood. And I could tell from rad, he's getting nervous with you guys being in South Africa the next day or two they were going to call it and we were going to come back if that's what we wanted to do. And I'm like, well, that's fine. I'm going to stick it out and I'm going to stay positive. Rad stayed positive. Alex, he was peeing his pants a little bit, but he was positive. Kid Moore, who had been doing this since you, way before you were alive, yes. is like, on day 13, he throws hands up. He's like, man, I don't fucking know. He's like, I was like, what's the long, longest lion hunt you ever been on? He's like, 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. I was like, all right. Well, you know, it's it's whatever. And we go to a bait site where we were getting we were getting some action on it at this point. And a lot of it was nocturnal. And it's a difficult one to get into. And the lions when they see you, if you drive in, if you walk in, they'll run. Yeah. If you if they're used to vehicles around because there's anti poaching that's right. always in vehicles going around the property because they have rhinos and the elephants and stuff. So they have, you know, a lot of these are like ex-soldiers, and this is their job. They're paid nonstop on all these properties Mm -hmm. to drive around and check for, you know, um, all the roads. Like, there's uh, a few people that drive tractors every day. 
dragging the roads, and that's so they can see if poachers cross the roads. Mm. And the anti-poaching guys who are ex-soldiers generally will track the poachers, and they'll capture them, arrest them. And, yeah. and it's taken seriously there because it's a, it's a large part. I mean, this is, you know, like their gross national product is like hunting, basically. Yeah. And, um, you know, and the rhino, you know, that's a thing. Like they get three grand if they poach a rhino, but like a rhino hunt can be like 60 grand. Right. Yeah. So it's way better for the community. And um, so anyway, this is the 15th day. That morning we go in. And at this point, like everybody's like all the typical rules for lion hunting, it's out the window. Like we know that it's way hotter than normal. It's late in the season. They're not reacting the way that they do. They'll be on bait for a day and you don't see them for three days. It is not typical when it's cooler. And so they're like, what do you guys think? And it's like, well, we know we've been getting lions and we've been, we've gotten pictures of a couple of sh shooters on this camera. And so it's the place we're concentrating on. And so we're like, let's just park here and we're going to, we're going to walk in and it's going to take an hour or so. Right. And you know, and that's dangerous in and of itself Yeah. because there's been some days we roll in there and we're half a mile from the bait and they are lying next to the road. Yeah. And so you can get in a situation to where you got, you have to shoot a lion in defense. Mm. And we're like, <clears throat> we all say, I think <clears throat> I'm like, I think we should walk in. And that was kind of their plan. <clears throat> and we left it up to Kidmore that morning. Yeah. Cause he's the most distraught. Like yeah. he's never failed on a lion hunt. And he is, he is like constantly thinking and, you know, talking to Alex and figuring what we should do. And, and, and Kidmore is this awesome Mozambican dude that his whole life he's lion hunting. Yeah. And he feels like beat by the lions. And he is really trying to figure it out. And he says, yes, we should walk. Okay. Yeah. And we're walking in and, uh, you know, it takes a while. And we get near the bait and we see a, a couple female lions. And they're kind of off, lying off no cubs or anything we see a young male lion mm. and and that's like all we see we're like okay well it was a good try and as we kind of get up on this ridge on this opposing hill kid more like snaps his fingers and it's like tsh, and the lion that we wanted you know mm. he's old he's all scarred up the pictures are online now we can post a picture here he's on the the mountain beside us and he's a he he's a couple hundred yards, yeah. And he's just slowly walking, and it's amazing how well they can blend, even a yeah. cat that big. But he does, and we get set up, and um, it's a longer shot than you generally want to make. But at this point in the hunt, and I'd shot several other animals, like I shot a zebra two hundred yards offhand with yeah, eight yeah. six, and so Alex is like, "Okay, we'll be fine." And so by the time we get in a position, we get set up, and we're waiting for the camera because we want to video this. Mm -hmm. Um, one tree on the side of that hill. Oh yeah, he sat right behind it. Right behind it in the shade. <laughs> yeah. He goes and lays down, and he's facing the other way. And I post a video. We can post again here. We're set up, and that thing roars. It's 200 yards away, and it roars facing the other way. It is horrifying. Yeah. And uh, so we wait, and we wait, and he stands up, and he walks out, and I am on him as he's walking, and he's 200 yards. And I'd made, with this gun, shots over that at this point, and I'm confident. And I got Alex in my ear, and he's trying to tell me the right thing. And I'm prone to shoot stuff walking at that distance. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of that. And I'm on it, and I've got my Swarovski Z8. Shout out to them. Yeah. Appreciate you guys. Got the Z8i. I got the dot on. I'm on maybe four power. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not on eight power because I want that field of view. Because you know, lions gonna run. He's fast. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm on him. And if it were just me and Rad, I would have shot. Yeah. And about the time I'm thinking about I take up the first stage of the trigger, I take up the slack. And Alex is in my ear. He says, "Don't shoot till he stops walking." Yeah. 
and I'm on him. I feel so confident, and I should have shot. Because at that point, if he's at 200, by the time he stops walking, he could be at 240, 260, whatever. Like, granted, maybe that's not how it turned out, but yeah, that's disheartening Who knows? for sure. Um, but what I should have done is shot when I felt comfortable. Right. And you should, with that said, caveat, always listen to your pH. Yes. But <laughs> I have not hunted with Alex a lot. Rad would have told me to shoot with yeah. him walking. And Alex kind of owned this hunt. And, um, and, he stops walking and I shoot and I make the worst fucking shot I've ever made. Oh, no. Like I'm nervous. I was totally comfortable when he was walking. Yeah. And shout out to silencers. Had I not had a silencer, that lion would have fucked off over that mountain. We'd have never seen him. I shot just in front of him. Oh, just in front of him. And he turned around and he took two more steps up. But looked around, he had no idea what happened. Right. And I drilled him through the shoulders. And he fell and he roared. And it was horrifying. And when he fell, he kind of turned around the other way. I put one right behind his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And then once we recovered him, the shots are like two inches apart. That's awesome. And then uh, he rolled over and exposed like his chest and belly. And I put one through his chest and it came out right beside his spine between his shoulders. And that was it. And um, because to me, and I was going to shoot again. I was like, stop yeah. shooting. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, I don't want to chase a, a wounded lion. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that I think is probably the only bad shot I made in that month of being over there. And I probably shot 30 animals. And, man, it was just like the excitement being on those sticks, waiting. I should have taken the shot when I knew I had the shot mm-hmm. and was comfortable. Um but man, had I not had a silencer, it'd been 15 days. I would have been heartbroken. Yeah. Um, but I was able to follow up, you know, and with the fix, thankful for that short throw, man. I mean, it's a matter of half a second. I put another round and put it through his shoulders. Yeah. Um, um, but man, that was, you talk about like, if you watch hunting videos or shows, you see people get emotional and I don't generally get emotional when I hunt in general. And I didn't cry when this happened. But I instantly, because like kid, if it hadn't been for Kidmore, we would not have seen that line. Right. And man, I hugged him instantly. And I think he was probably three times happier than me. Well, yeah, you just but, spent two weeks going through the suck and find like the, for it to all come into, to it, you got it done. Like for all of us, like, I mean, those guys didn't take 15 days to get on hunt, but you spend an entire day after this single animal. And especially if you have opportunities where, you you rip a shot over its back or something yeah. like that and then because you just like some of the guys said it even on the podcast it's like we didn't come across the world to miss shots or to have malfunction or like that's not what we came here for. <laughs> yeah good luck with that man yeah i mean that's where i i shot and trained and prepared a lot for this trip and i don't know well i shot better than everybody on this trip and that's not normal like yeah my hunt before with Thomas, like I was not prepared to put a scope on the day before. I didn't take it that seriously. And I fucked some shots up. And and generally, you know, we'll make it right. Um, I think that's the only shot that I fucked up on the whole trip. I mean, even with we lost a water buck. I mean, hunting is, is very heartbreaking. Yeah. It is an emotional thing. And nobody ever wants to wound something. And then you don't want to miss because like just the disappointment in itself. But in two days, I put two shots on a water buck. Yeah. that were great shots and that is just a big it's durable still animal over there. It's and it's still yeah. yeah and that was uh that was six five it wasn't the eight six but man and both times and especially that second time it tumbled 150 yards down a mountain stood up and fucked off yeah. like it had just stubbed its toe that was like i mean mitch shot an impala and it crushed it and everyone was basically being like hey yeah good shot Woo, yeah and then out of nowhere, it got up and took off. Yeah, and like, it, it's a good t- shot till it ain't. Yeah. I mean, you just, you never know. And that's where, like, I've learned with the lion, I, I would have emptied the magazine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably. I mean, I, I probably would have shot it two more times. I just know, like, that's a big, strong animal. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to go bait it out of a bush. No. You know, it's like, well, it's there. And, and you could lose it. Um, and that's a miserable feeling. Um you know, and it wasn't the gun. Like, I blame it on whatever. It's just like, I fucked the shot up. And I, I'm thankful that I missed completely rather than just, right. like, grazed it yeah, or a superficial it, yeah. wound and it fucked off over the hill. Um, 
And what, if I hadn't had a silencer, no way. The lion would have known exactly where we were. I had a silencer. The lion didn't know where the shot came from. And he took a few steps and he looked and I fucking drilled him. Yeah. And, you know, in that time in the video, you can hear me say, what the fuck? And you can hear me take a deep breath and let it out. Yeah. And I did all the things right that I fucked up on the first shot when I blew it. I did all the things right and I made three perfect shots after that. Mm-hmm.